Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this Easter worship service. If you're a visitor here among us, you are also most welcome. We also welcome those watching at home on live stream. There are the following announcements this morning. Uh, nominated for the office of elder, brothers Phil Banstra, Rick Banstra, Matt Dykstra, Steve Underwater, John Penninga, Bill Vanessen, and Ed Weeringa. Nominated for the office of deacon, brothers Norman DeYoung, Ed DeRuder, Willie Hofsink, and Spencer Rapp. And the election of office bearers will take place, the Lord willing, on April the 14th after the morning worship service. There will be a council meeting this Wednesday, April the 3rd at 7.30 p.m. And the council will meet with those desiring to make public profession of faith this Thursday, April the 4th, beginning at 7 p.m. The annual general meeting will take place this Saturday, April the 6th at 7.30 p.m. And you're all heartily encouraged to attend. And finally, the collections today will be for those in need locally and abroad. And next week they will be for word and deed. Uh, let us now rise for worship. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 135, verses 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant, and it is a joy to worship the Lord together this morning. Let us now confess our dependence on God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Receive the greeting from our Lord, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now honor the Lord in praise and we'll sing our opening song, hymn 32, verses 1 and 2. This morning we are going to turn to Exodus chapter 20 for the reading of God's holy law. We submit ourselves to the righteous and fitting requirement of God, requirement of holiness in obedience to his character of perfection. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. If we were left on our own to contend with this righteous requirement of God that we see in his Ten Commandments, we would surely be people who are entirely lost But it's also true that if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, we would also be lost. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. We did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, We are of people most to be pitied. Then we read these glorious words, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What a comfort for us today. And so it is with that in mind that we praise God. Let's now turn to Psalm 98 and we'll sing verses 1 and 2.
There are a number of matters that we will uh, pray for this morning. We'll continue to pray for the Van Groothiest family. Thankful that yesterday we could gather together for the funeral service to receive comfort from the Word of God, and we pray that this family may continue to be comforted moving forward. I will give thanks to the Lord that Reverend Behrens could recently celebrate his 84th birthday. Uh, we'll praise God in prayer that brother and sister Matthew and Juliana Wickerink could receive the gift of a healthy daughter. Um, we will also pray uh, in thankfulness that brother and sister Andrew and Jane Berendreth could recently celebrate a 54th wedding anniversary. And also give thanks to the Lord that brother and sister Tim and Clorinda Penninga can look forward to the celebration of their 25th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Let us now unite together in prayer. Our dear Lord and our heavenly Father, thank you for this day, a day of rest to be sure, but a day of worship and a day of celebration. We commemorate and we rejoice in the great event that has made Sunday our day of worship. So that each week again there is the proclamation of victory and triumph because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. The one who conquered sin and Satan and even death itself. What a glorious message that is. And we pray that it may be a message that Christians all over the world rejoice in, find comfort in, strength, or that it may motivate your people to know that the victory has been won. That is truly good news. We pray that this good news may also be spread all over the globe to those who have not heard it, who have not understood it, who have not accepted it. And so we pray that the news of Christ's resurrection may not just be for us, but also the community here in Smithers to be shared not just this time of year, but each week again, that many more may know and experience how awesome it is that there is life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this good news, O Lord. It is what provides comfort even in the face of grief and loss. We continue to remember the Van Groothiest family, Sister Rose Van Groothiest, children, siblings, many family members also in church this morning. We thank you that even in the midst of grief, family could assemble together to receive a message of hope. And so we pray for this family, also moving forward, that we as brothers and sisters in the Lord may continue to encourage them, reach out in love. We pray that this comfort may be for all the family. We also pray for traveling mercies as family members return home from afar this week. We thank you for the gift of new life that you have given to brother and sister Wickerink, Matthew and Juliana, the gift of a daughter, precious gift, and we praise you for that gift. So thankful that things have gone well. Lord, we thank you for the gift of continued life also together. We continue to pray for brother and sister Andrew and Jane Berendrecht, thankful that they could celebrate another year of, of being together. Challenging circumstances, but circumstances, O oh Lord, in which you continue to strengthen them and care for them, and we are grateful for that. We pray for brother and sister Tim and Clarinda Penninga. We're thankful that they can look forward to celebration of a 25th wedding anniversary tomorrow. May it be a blessed day and a joyful day. May you continue to care for them also in the year to come. We also remember brother Reverend Ben Behrens, that he could recently celebrate an 84th birthday. We're thankful, O oh Lord, that you continue to sustain him and we ask that you would care for him in the year to come, also with his wife and, and children in this congregation. 
Lord, we pray that you would be with all of us this morning. We're so thankful for everyone here in church. We're so thankful for those who could also watch at home. We gather together, O oh Lord, to submit to you and also to submit to your holy word. It is the word of life. It is the word of truth, and it contains great hope. And so we pray that you would bless us as we hear that word read and proclaimed. Reach into our hearts and speak to us through your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Let's now open up Holy Scripture. We'll turn this morning once again to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 27, I'd like to begin our reading actually at verse uh, 57, and we'll read through to chapter 28, verse 15. Listen to the word of God. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So far a reading. Let's now stand and sing in praise of Christ's resurrection, hymn 31, verses 1 and 2.
like to now invite you to open your Bibles uh, once again, and we'll turn to our text for the sermon this morning, Matthew 28, verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in a calendar year, there are two dates that of course stand out very clearly for us as Christians, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And while of course each of these events are a tremendous blessing for us, each of them present us with significant challenges. For Good Friday, the challenge is one of trying to grasp what Jesus has endured for us. And we cannot, even by God's grace, begin to understand how bad hellish agony was for the Lord Jesus. And praise God that we will never experience that. And yet, what we hope is that by having some concept of how hard it was for the Lord Jesus, we will then be all the more thankful for what he actually did for us in our place. The challenge for Good Friday is also in realizing just how gracious and how loving God really is. We think of the Lord Jesus enduring mockery and shame as we heard on Good Friday. Well, we are people who by nature mock the Lord with our sin. It wasn't just them. We can so easily trample underfoot the sacrifice of Christ and do that callously, thoughtlessly, willfully sinning. You know, I think of that beautiful song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. I'm by nature a mocker as well. I'm no better than those others who are calling out to him. Their voice is my voice. And then you get a sense of how sinful we really are. What we cost God and the Lord Jesus And then the challenge with Good Friday is then to believe that despite all those sins and despite that sinful nature, he really did pay for everything. There is a great tragedy to Good Friday. But the wonder of our awesome God is that through that tragedy, there is also a glorious message. And that gives us joy and thankfulness. A Good Friday is not easy. But then what about Easter Sunday? Well, what is the challenge there? Well, the fact of Good Friday we are aware of. The Lord Jesus rose from the dead. And there is also a requirement for us actually to just pause and think about those words. He was dead, but he came back to life. But then for many of us, accepting that fact, knowing it to be true, the challenge then is to grasp how life-changing the resurrection really is. Now, it's true. If Jesus, and we read about this, 1 Corinthians 15, without Jesus rising from the dead, there is no salvation. 
All would be darkness, all would be despair. Death would reign, there is no eternal life, there is no hope. Go home. There's no point in being here. Paul said, we would of all people been the most to be pitied because all our hope is pinned on the resurrection. But the thing, brothers and sisters, is the resurrection is not just a salvation issue. It is that. But it is also something to change our lives here and now. What does the fact of Christ rising from the dead mean for you and your life? How does it affect you? That's the question. Do you have any confusion about how your life is supposed to be different? Well, if you do, we can be very thankful that in the Bible, there were a lot of confused people around the time of Jesus' death. And it is how Jesus reacted to that confusion that is so beautiful because we find in his reaction and in his words clarity and truth for our lives today. He gives us the gift of new life, life renewal. So that's what we'll focus on this morning, the resurrection and Jesus' gift of life renewal. Now, after Jesus died... There were problems for every character you read about. They all had problems. Uh, we, we read that passage from Matthew. It's filled with people who are either confused because of their stubborn unbelief, which was some, or they were confused because they just didn't get it. The Spirit had not revealed it to them. So if you look in your Bible... Let's begin at verse 57, which is where our reading began. Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of the Lord Jesus. He loved Jesus. And the fact that he was a disciple indicated both love and faith. That's what he was acting out of. And his actions show a great care for Christ, even in the care of his body. And you may also know for yourself, that's what you do when you love someone and they've died. You take care of the body. You ensure that it is properly taken care of. What does he do? He takes the body. That's how it's referred to, the body. And he wraps it in a clean linen shroud and he lays it, it says in our, our reading, in his own new tomb which he had cut in the rock. He had prepared a place for himself, but when the Lord Jesus died, he said, it's not about me. I'm giving it to him out of love. And yet for Joseph, the story was over. Look at the end of verse 60. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. He left because what else was there for him to do there? I did all I could and now this chapter is over. Once a body is laid to rest, there's not much point in staying there for a long time. Then look at the women. Verse 61, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. And you can just picture them watching what's happening. Stone is rolled in front. That's all they can do. After a while, they too went home. And so the problem for Joseph, the problem for the women, is a great emptiness. With their Savior gone, what is next? What really mattered now? He's dead. Then we get to the chief priests and the Pharisees, verses 62 to 66. Well, what was their problem? Certainly unbelief, rebellion against God. They hated Jesus. They hated his popularity. 
They hated the challenges he gave to them, the way he confronted them, and was utterly unafraid of their spiritual bullying. And yet with his death, they hadn't won. They were in a terrible position. And you might think, well, they wouldn't have felt that, would they? Weren't they happy? They got everything they wanted. They got to humiliate him. And then he died. Weren't things exactly the way they liked them to be? Oh, no, they weren't. Because they were in a terrible situation. And I'll share what that terrible situation is. It's an awful place to be. They were in a situation living in fear that the words of the Lord Jesus might come true. That's a bad place to be in. You know, there was just something about the Lord Jesus and the way he spoke. He taught as one who had authority. They could not shake off those words. They dreaded the thought of the resurrection. And of course, the irony is that it is the enemies of Christ following his death who remember his words, who hold them front and center. But it's his followers who just forgot the whole thing. And so these were days that were filled with a quiet dread and great anxiety for the Jewish leaders. Pilate said to them, you've got this troop of soldiers. Go make the tomb as secure as you can. For them, the pressing desire is, we don't want anything to happen. And then later, we also read that last section, which is really sad. Bribing the guards, spreading lies. It's a disaster for them. Dreading that nothing would happen. And then, and then the women go back. They're not going back thinking, you know what? Something could happen. He did say that he would rise from the dead. It wasn't like that. We know from other gospel accounts that they couldn't finish the job of, of the body and, and the spices and so on. The anointing, they had run out of time. And yet when the angel appears to them, it's a message of reassurance. Don't be afraid. I know that you're seeking Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen as he said. So these women go from no hope to amazing hope. And their hearts are filled with joy. And it's a really beautiful thing that the Lord reaches out to these women who by law couldn't be official witnesses, but says, no, you are going to be the witnesses. He elevates them to an amazing position. Come see the empty tomb and go share that good news with others. These women who had so lovingly provided for Jesus during his ministry. These women who had stood by the cross when the disciples had fled, they were right there unable to do anything to help him as he suffered on the cross. And now they're told, the one you love is not dead, but he's alive. Now I'd like you to notice how these women react to this good news. Look at verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. That's an amazing combination, and the Holy Spirit has perfectly captured exactly what they were feeling in their hearts. Maybe you know for yourself, when you receive very, very good news, there's a small part of you that can almost be afraid because you're afraid maybe you're mistaken and it isn't that. Maybe that news isn't 100% accurate. Maybe I misunderstood it. Maybe it actually isn't going to happen. Some of that for them. Maybe a kind of holy and reverent fear, the power of God at work. And yet it wasn't fear in the sense of terror or a, fe a fear that was fueled by guilt or shame. It wasn't that. And we know that's true because the text says it was fear mixed with great joy. 
And that shows that these women were in a very, very good position. Bearers of good tidings of great joy. And they didn't wander away from the tomb in utter bewilderment or with hesitation. They didn't stumble away. The text says they ran to tell the disciples. They could not wait to share what they had heard. Overjoyed to share that news and share it with the disciples. He's alive. But I would like to just stop for a moment. The angel had said, tell his disciples. Disciples, true disciples, are loyal. They are students who listen, who follow, who obey. Disciples are those who are devoted to their teacher. These are men who had been hand-picked by the Lord Jesus. I'm going to take you and you and you. You will be my disciples. And they had followed him through many trials and many difficulties. They had seen him do incredible things, miracles over nature, miracles over disease, miracles over death. They had heard him preaching like they had never heard preaching before. The one who spoke like no other. He had done everything for them. And when it mattered the most, they had all deserted him and fled. When he was suffering on the cross, one of them found his way back. Nowhere to be found, the rest of them. One of the prominent elders or disciples had even sworn on oath within sight of the Lord Jesus, I swear by the living God, I do not know Jesus of Nazareth. What kind of disciples were these? So what is the problem for the disciples? We've talked about problems for the others. What are they dealing with? They're dealing with their sin. They're dealing with their shame. They're up against their faithlessness and their weakness. That empty boasting, well, it turned out to be empty boasting before his arrest. Even if all the others flee, I never will. And they all said the same. You know, we tend to think of those disciples after Jesus died as being just confused. They didn't, un they didn't remember his words. They didn't know what the future was going to hold. That is true. But a more accurate picture is the disciples struggling with guilt and struggling with their total inadequacy. We were disciples, but what kind of disciples were we in the end? Pathetic. So unworthy. So useless. In the one moment Jesus needed them, they turned their back on him. They weren't there for him. Now, if we have a loved one who dies... It can be very natural for us to look back, and I would imagine many of us have done this. You say, well, did I do enough? Could I have done more? Or you say, I wasn't there when he or she most needed me. Well, there is only so much that can be done, but in this case, they willingly, intentionally left him behind. And if that's the kind of thing you're up against, then what do you think the news that Jesus was alive would have meant to them? And maybe you think, well, when you hear Jesus is alive, then you just immediately forget all your sins and your failures. You know you're forgiven, and you just rejoice in the news that Jesus is alive.
far more realistic scenario is one in which the disciples then think, what now for us? What is he going to do to us? The women have fear, but it is mixed with joy. The disciples might expect to have great fear. And nor are the disciples alone in this. We all have ways in which we fail. We all have ways in which we have turned our back on the Lord. And look at all that we have received. The complete word of God. The proclamation of the good news week after week. We have seen the goodness of God in so many ways in our lives. And yet how often don't we willfully sin? How often don't we use our time in sinful ways? How often don't we use our minds in sinful ways? Our bodies in sinful ways? Claiming to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus but failing so often. And our conscience can grievously accuse us You call yourself a Christian, but look at how you act. Are you really showing that you live for the Lord? Are you really a Christian? The disciples had serious reason for guilt. They had serious reason for shame. And so do we. We can say that they were failures, but let us also in humility also say in many ways, so are we, failures. But then look at the encounter of the Lord Jesus with the women when he sees them himself. He accepts their worship which is right and fitting. He is the living God. But then he assures them, do not be afraid. And then he says, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Now pay very careful attention here. The angel had said, go and tell his disciples. Now can you imagine if the Lord Jesus merely repeated those words? Go and tell my disciples to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, if I were one of those disciples, those words would fill me with great uneasiness and with great fear, maybe even with terror. For then, the appearance of a living Savior would cause my troubled heart to be consumed with worry because of my sin and my shame. The words of the Lord Jesus then would appear like a summons for judgment. You tell my disciples to come, and I will see them in Galilee, and I will deal with them there. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, go and tell my brothers. My brothers. And coming from the Lord Jesus, those words are so filled with meaning and with love and with compassion and grace and mercy. You know, earlier in his ministry, the Lord Jesus had been speaking to a crowd and somebody said to him, "Uh, your mother and your brothers are waiting for you. They want to talk to you. And then he turned to his disciples and he said... Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Look at my disciples. These are my brothers. And yet since that time, they had failed in such astounding ways. But the message of the Lord Jesus, risen from the grave, is one of great grace to each and every one of them. I know you're a sinner. I know you have failed in many ways. But I still love you. You belong to me. You belong to my Father. You are my brothers. The bond was not broken. And so 
All their hope and their future are found in the grace of God. It's not about their devotion. It's not about their goodness. It's about the faithfulness of the Lord. They could never have been good enough in themselves. They could never measure up. But in Christ, they had all that they needed. That's the message that the risen Lord has as soon as he has risen from the dead for his poor, confused, suffering, broken disciples. And the resurrection cemented that bond. Now we will never be apart. He had perfectly secured their salvation. And they could celebrate that Jesus, whom they dearly loved, but whom they had failed, was not dead, but he was alive again. That's true, and what a miracle it was. But the message of the Lord Jesus is not merely, I'm alive. It is, I am your salvation. You can find everything you need in me. It wasn't that they were so good. They failed, but they were accepted. There was new life for them. Before, they had loved him, but then they had seen in such profound ways their own failures. Now they receive grace from the living Christ. What does it mean? Your life is not in you. Your life is is in the Lord Jesus. Salvation is about, yet not I, but Christ in me. All our sin and shame, let it go. It's paid for. It's been conquered. All the guilt we carry for the sins we have committed, he took that guilt away. Any any idea of our own worthiness or good works Yet not I. Don't rest on things that you've done. Salvation and new life are not found in us. Christ in me. His life is my life. And all of that is found in that loving and reassuring message to the disciples. Don't be afraid. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Sometimes we may struggle with guilt and with shame for a long time. Sometimes it's sins or specific sins that weigh heavily upon us. And that can be a crushing burden you carry for a long time, like a millstone around your neck. So wearisome to carry, disheartening crushing, weighing us down. But what is salvation about? Yes, sorrow for sins. Yes, a contrite heart. But then, always coming back to, yet not I. I can't earn my salvation, but nor will my weaknesses separate me from Christ. For all of my hope and all of my comfort is found in the fact that Jesus is alive. And he says, do not be afraid. You are my brother. You are my sister. That's his message to us today. And nothing shall change that. And so you see, brothers and sisters, that to know Christ risen from the dead is new life. That's what spurs us on. That's what renews us. You know, the Lord Jesus said in John 10, his message as the good shepherd, he said, I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. It is abundant life to find life in Christ alone, to look beyond ourselves. How liberating it is to believe that and experience it. That's what drives change also today. 
You know, I admire fellow Christians who seek to change. I admire people in this congregation and elsewhere, for example, who are in the life renewal program. I admire you for that. And and joining that program may come from a desire for things to be different. It may come from a desire to, to address sin, also from the past. It may come from a heartfelt desire to grow closer to the Lord to address the truth of who we are in our brokenness and our sin and our shame. The wonder of the resurrection is to inspire all of us, whether we're in that program or not, to seek new life in Christ so that we all grow in holiness, that we all grow in our walk with Christ. That's life renewal that there is power in a risen Lord. That's what fuels men and women, boys and girls, to live new lives. And there is much that's possible. This time of year, we celebrate new life in the spring, a wonderful sign that, that what wasn't alive can become alive. And for us as well, new behaviors are possible. Relationships can grow and thrive, can be reestablished. Bonds can be strengthened. Hope can grow. It takes effort. Of course it takes effort. You can't just sit back and expect that, that life and behaviors will somehow be different on, of, of themselves. But what provides the foundation, the fuel, the assurance, the motivation is that we have a risen Lord who loves us, who claims us, and whose life is proof that we are spiritually alive. And it is in living for our Savior that we experience life renewal. And then we may confess with joyful hearts, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before his throne. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. And when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but Christ in me. Amen. Let's now sing that beautiful song, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you can find it in the supplement, page 89.
Let us pray. Our great and glorious God and Father, what good news of great joy you have given to us in a way that could only come from you, that broken, sinful people can be restored through Jesus Christ, that we who by nature were your enemies are so loved and so cherished. We pray for those in our midst who may struggle with feelings of complacency, feeling lost. We pray that they may turn to the Lord Jesus and find new hope, new life. We pray for those who feel stuck in sin and the bonds of sin. Those bonds are broken by Christ's resurrection. And we pray that there may be new life, a new way of living. We pray that you would be with all of us, that we may rejoice in new life in Christ, to live life in him abundantly. Lord, please be with us us as a congregation, that each and every one of us may experience your great love to find peace in it, to find comfort and to find reassurance and then to share that love with those around us. Lord, you have given us great hope and on this day we rejoice in Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, our Savior. We pray, O God, that you may bless us further on this day, continue to keep us in your care. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now honor the Lord through the giving of our thank offerings.
Let us now once again rise to praise the Lord and we'll stand to sing our closing song, hymn 32. We'll sing the verses 3 and 4. Receive the blessing of the Lord and go home in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.